Thank you that you welcome us. Thank you that as we come before you, you are there to commune with us. Bless us now. In the name of Jesus. That's a beautiful chorus. And one that I'm going to ask Richard to be well to put back up there on the screen. I know I didn't ask you in advance, but if you could put it back up there so that we can look at these words again. We come to worship Him. Worship Him. To magnify His name. To uplift and concentrate on Him. A beautiful chorus. And I'm almost struck by it. I, I always enjoy that particular chorus. But I'm going to tell you, I've got a, a couple of little things with it that I find a little bit, you know, doesn't make me quite comfortable. It's the chorus. Now, one of the parts says, lift up holy hands. And many times when I come to that portion of the chorus, I have to stop and say, Lord, are they really holy? Are they really holy? Now, I understand. And I, I know that yes, I can look at them and say, because they're in Christ. And in Christ, there's holiness. And I can look at it and say, I'm in Christ. That's the topic I put on the message here today. You in Christ. Me in Christ. And therefore, I should be able to come boldly and say, lift up holy hands. And I guess I should be doing that all the time. But all the while I have to keep singing to be like Jesus. This hope possesses me. And I have to ask myself, is that reality for today? Is that where I am today? So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's not just singing through the words, but allowing the words to challenge us. Now I've got another little issue with that chorus, and, and it's, it's a minor thing, I suppose, you could say. But one of the verses goes on to say, forget about yourself and concentrate on Him. And I don't mind telling you that I'd like to talk with the person who wrote this because I'd like to change that a little bit. Somehow or another, and I don't know, I'm not, I don't have the answer about to change that. But you know what? I don't think God wants me to come to Him and forget about myself. I really don't. I believe that God wants me to come to Him with all of my shame, with all of my sin, with all of my hurt, with all of my sorrow, with all of the difficulties that I could possibly come up with. And when I come to Him, He wants me to bring them to Him. He wants to know that I'm not coming to put on a show. I'm not coming to say, this is, you know, what I'm like. And I'm going to forget about all my difficulties. Because he wants me to come with the difficulties. He wants me to come with all of those things every time. Because, you see, worship is meant to be communication. Communion with God. We are to commune with Him. And so, how can I possibly come to God and, and air my heart gray because of 
some situation that I'm going through, and I got to leave that behind. You know, God wants me to come boldly with that. Bring it before Him and allow Him to give me healing within. The sickness, the sorrow, the sadness, the simple mindedness. That's what God wants me to bring. And we will come with Him and communicate with Him and have communion with Him in a real or personal way with all of my baggage, if you want to call it that. He's got something to say to us. <laughs> and if we, if we don't come to worship with the idea that God is going to be speaking to us. You know, sometimes we, we, we come into a service even, and we say, okay, now is the opening song, and then we'll have a prayer song, and then we'll have the scripture reading, and we'll have something else, and on and on we go. And at the end of the service, we're like a bunch of wrecks. We run a race. But it's not a race. Do we take the time to say, God, what do you want to say to me today? What do you want to say to me right now in this situation where I am, wherever that happened to be? And I believe sometimes we do a disservice to God by not allowing Him to really speak to the inner being. Speak to the inner being. And I... When Paul wrote Ephesians 3, and I pointed it out to you earlier there in verse 16, you may be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. And then he goes on to say, I pray that you may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Try to wrap your arms around that idea. Try to uh, somehow or another let your mind. How big is that? How great, how wonderful is that? To know that love that surpasses knowledge. It, it blows our minds, we could say. Filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. One of the commentators that I was looking at uh, suggested that Paul was using the language that uh, Ezekiel used in chapters 40 to 43. I'm not going to go back there. But it was a time when they were in the process of getting a new temple. They needed a new temple built. The people were in exile. And so Ezekiel talks about this new church and he talks about the, the length and the width and the height and the depth of this new temple. The people were into despair and suffering, away from home. Oppression was on every side. But he wanted people to hold on to a hope Something that went beyond the present time and our circumstances and say, look, God has got something greater in store for us. And I believe, you know, we can't just talk about the temple. We can't just talk about a building. But we've got to talk about God's riches, God's fullness, God's desire to commune with you and me. Whatever the circumstances. Paul prayed for the church that they be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. He's not praying that my dreams or my plans would come true. No. But the overflowing abundance of God's love 
We bring all of our weakness to God in an act of worship, and He fills us with a love that blows our mind. I was talking to Martha this week, and I talk to her, of course, every day. Uh, and uh, while I was talking with her, she said, Dad, Dad, if you were down at sea level, and you looked out across the ocean, how far would you be able to see? I had no idea. I suppose I'd be able to see, I don't know, 12 or 15 miles. She said, you might be able to see it from the top of the hill where you are, but if you were down to sea level, you wouldn't see it. And I don't know where she got the information. I assume it's correct. But about five miles, we're able to see if we're at sea level. Top of the hill, here, we can see much weather. And I thought about it. You know, you broke the plane, and you can see way off there in the distance. The guys up in the spaceships, how far do they see? We become a little ball, <laughs> and they can see the ball. But just think about it. The universe, how vast is it? How wonderful is it? And yet, that's only just part of God's creation. That's all that was. The God that we serve is, is, is far beyond His love and His <coughs> desire that we would come and worship Him. Jesus made a point of telling us that He wants to give us life to the full. And so in John 10 and 10, in the New International Version, it says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now I include it there and put in the uh, New Living Translation. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. None of this mundane stuff, none of this I'm dragging along, I'm keeping going, keeping my head above water. We've had too much of that, I believe. And when we think of this COVID, you know, what's it done to us? Some of it has, has been that, that attitude. You know, I'm surviving. We've got the God, the universe, the Almighty One on our side. And we're just surviving. What an insult to him. That the thought would even enter my mind. Just surviving. You see, sometimes the problem that we have as Christians is that we've got a distorted opinion. That somehow or another, uh, this Christian life has got to do with our personal sacrifice. And, and our personal efforts that we're going to put into something. And we fail because our efforts don't measure up and we feel defeated. So, again, I would say, don't forget about your weakness. Bring them to the Lord with you. But don't forget that you're coming to one who is the Almighty. That's where we, we, you know, not, not what well, I'm going to bring, that's only Miss Gary. But we're coming to the one who knows all about it and knows all about us. I did a little bit of berry picking this week. Now I'm not Ken. And I'm not Barbara. So, you know, I go berry picking and I take a picker in my hand and I bend over and I, you know, if the berries are plentiful, I manage to get them and get a few berries. And I hope the wind is blowing because there's going to be a lot of leaves and 
whatever else in there. But you know, before I put them in the pot, that bucket of berries has been changed a lot. All of that rubbish is gone. Now I could take the time and go over there on the barren somewhere or another, and I could kneel down and I could almost one at a time, or with uh, you know just a handful or something, and and I'd manage to pick the berries and to be nice and clean. And I'd come home and I'd say to my wife, you know, I was over there for two hours and they're gonna have me Or I could come back and say, I was over there for two hours and I got five gallons. What would please her most? Well, both cases, she'd probably say, you shouldn't be at it anyhow. <laughs> but that's kind of exciting. Point. But sometimes we come to God and we think that everything is going to be clean and perfect. And how many blessings do we miss out on? Because we don't bring all of our everything, all of ourselves, our total being to Him. We'll lay it before Him. The wind will take away God's, God's power is big enough to take away all that old leaves and all that old stuff. There's a chorus that says, Creator, Come create me. Something to glorify me. You made all the heavens and earth out of nothing. So what did I bring? <laughs> you made it all out of nothing. That's all I can be. Unless, Lord, you do something with me. With my weakness, with my silly ways. I'll ask the folks to sing it for us, please. Mm -hmm. 